This is a really wonderful day for New York City and a wonderful day for the fire department. And I think that, get my ordering right here, yes. First, we're going to hear from someone who serves this city and this department every day. He is a proud Brooklynite. He serves in Brooklyn. FDNY Lieutenant Chris Gancy, the son of late Chief of Department Peter Gancy, Jr. They wanted us to speak in height order, so <laughs> that's why I went first. I also told them to uh, make sure they ordered the largest podium they could, <laughs> make me look normal. <laughs> uh, welcome, Your Honor, distinguished guests. I'm truly honored to be here today to get an opportunity to say a few words. I learned a long time ago that the fire department is a family. You can retire, you can leave the job entirely, or sometimes, unfortunately, you can get killed. But once you become part of the fabric of the FDNY, you are forever woven into the rich history and traditions of our job. History and traditions that have been forged over 150 years of crawling down long, smoky hallways and always being there when people need us the most. Chief Nigro is part of that long history, and I couldn't be prouder than to call him Commissioner Nigro. My father loved Dan. He loved him. He was the perfect straight man to my father's loose sense of humor. Quick-witted, well-read, thoughtful. And Dan, he never minded that you were so tall. Hmm. He used to say, I had his old job, and I used to be that tall. <laughs> but all kidding aside, he thought the world of you. He was so confident of your leadership qualities that when he was the chief of department and you were the chief of operations, I remember him telling us that he would leave the overall administration of the job to Danny. That way he could focus on the things he knew best and couldn't screw up, the operations and management of the units in the field. When attempting to assuage the disappointment that we sometimes felt when fire department business interfered with Gansey business, he used to say that it was a difficult task to balance the needs of our family with the needs of his other 10,000 sons and daughters. In hindsight, it was a small sacrifice to pay for such a large responsibility. Commissioner Nigro, like Commissioner Cassano before you, I am confident that the safety of the members in the field and the citizens of this great city is as paramount to you as it was to my father. You studied hard throughout your career, you showed that hard work pays off, and you rose through the ranks and achieved almost every position in our esteemed department. That is why you are uniquely qualified to help the great members of this department execute our oath to the citizens of this city in the protection of life and property. In the days and months after September 11th, you helped get this job back on its feet. I remember thinking afterwards how proud my father would have been of you then. But I know for sure that today he'd be beaming with pride to see you achieve this monumentous achievement. Chief, welcome to the fire department. Thank you very much for letting me speak and say a few of these words. And I get the pleasure of introducing our distinguished mayor to speak next, Mayor Bill de Blasio. Thank you. Thank you. Well done, Well, Chris, thank you. And that was powerful and very much appreciated. And thank you again for your service and the extraordinary service that your family has done for this city. Well, before we go into the details of today, I want to thank a number of people who are here and are part of today, part of t making today happen also. First of all, I want to thank our host, Deputy Assistant Chief John Mooney, who runs this wonderful facility. And we're joined by the Chief of the Emergency Medical Service, Abdo Namod. Thank you for your presence here with us. Special thank you, and I think this is an example of what we all care about and what this is all about. The individuals behind us, these 23 probationary firefighters who literally, literally represent the future of a strong and safe New York City. Let's thank all of them. I just want to say objectively they are a damn good-looking group. I just want to say that. 
See, I can't get them to crack a smile at that. That proves how disciplined they are. I want to thank Robert Turner, FDNY Battalion Chief and former colleague of Dan Nigro's. I want to thank FDNY Lieutenant Mike Marshall, who's the diversity advocate. I want to thank members of our administration. Zach Carter is here, our Corporation Counsel, who's played an important role already in some of the important changes we're going to make for the future of this department. I want to thank the people who played a role in the process of bringing Dan Nigro in as our commissioner. Maya Wiley is here, my general counsel, and she was a key part of the process along with my chief of staff, Laura Santucci, and my first deputy mayor, Tony Shores. I want to thank OEM Commissioner Joe Bruno, who's been a great uh, crucial part of our response to so many emergencies and has worked so closely with this department as well. I want to thank a great friend and ally of this department, Liz Crowley, council member and chair of the Committee on Fire and Criminal Justice. And I want to thank our colleagues who represent the people who do the work, UFOA President Al Hagan and Izzy Miranda, President of the EMS Workers. I want to thank everyone for being a part of this important moment. I also want to thank John Combs, the president of the Vulcan Society. And a thank you that I think is particularly special, that your, your dad is here, yes? He is. That this is truly a family affair, because ahead of this Dan Nigro was Dan Nigro Sr., retired FDNY captain, 93 years old, and on top of the action as we speak. Would you point your dad out to us? There he is. There he is. Thank you. So this is a family that has devoted themselves to service to the city, and that's another reason why it's a great day for the fire department, a great day for the city. In Dan Nigro, we have an exemplary leader, a born leader, a man who served this department so well over decades, played every conceivable role there is to play, and did it with great distinction. I've got to tell you, as I've talked to people in recent days, the respect, the warmth in their voice when they talk about Dan Nigro, when they talk about his extraordinary history of commitment to this department, it's something that immediately tells you that this is a true leader, a natural leader who will run this agency well as we move forward into the future. Dan was raised in Bayside, Queens, and as you've seen, in a firefighting family. And Dan joined the department in 1969 and spent three decades in it. Uh, I saw what uh, Al Hagan said in the papers, and I think it was exactly right. Dan was a part of this department in some of its most challenging moments, late 60s and into the 70s, when so much of this city was tragically burning. And it was a time that really tested the mettle of our firefighters and our fire officers, and Dan rose to the occasion over and over again. And after those decades of service, after helping to see us through those very tough times, uh, that might have been assumed to be enough, but no one knew that one day was coming that would change everything forever. In September 11, 2001, Dan, as Chief of Operations, as you heard, was working alongside his dear friend, Peter Gancy, Chief of Department. In that day, no one knew what was to happen. No one knew how bad it would be. And in the midst of all of the challenges, in the midst of trying to fight through such a difficult situation, Dan learned that his dear friend had died in action. And yet, in the middle of that, Dan had to persevere. He had to keep fighting. He had to keep marshalling the troops. And he performed with great distinction that day, supervising the evacuation of Seven World Trade Center. He was quickly named chief of department, succeeding his friend and he had to lead the FDNY and inspire it through its darkest days and help get this department back on its feet. He's won a lot of awards over his career, not only in this city but beyond, across this country. Internationally, he's been recognized as a great leader. 
And what is most impressive to me about Dan is not how many years he's put in, how much he accomplished, how many awards he has won. What really impresses me is his vision for the future of this department. It's a vision rooted in a real love for the department and the people who make it up, the people who serve us every day. But he's always understood that as the world changes, we have to do more and more to continue to perfect this department, to keep it number one in this country, to make sure that we're always looking for ways to do things better, and to make sure it reflects all that is great about New York City. And when I've heard Dan talk about his vision, it's compelling. It's something that comes from the heart. It's something that comes from real experience. And some of what he achieved along the way speaks to that sense of always looking for a way to do things better. Dan did an extraordinary job helping to spearhead the merger between FDNY and EMS, which was important and crucial for the ability of this city to protect people in, in need. Dan played a key role in bringing the ComStat system into the fire department, helping to make sure operations went more smoothly and efficiently. And he's been devoted throughout his career to the notion that everyone deserves opportunity. It's part of who he is as a human being. And he has a great ability to relate to people from every part of the city, and he wants to make sure that this department reflects all that is great about this city. I know that he'll know how to do these things right because he's done it before over and over again. And I think that the future is bright because we're putting some of the challenges of the past behind us. In March, we settled a civil rights lawsuit that was brought by the Vulcan Society that needed to be settled, that needed to delineate a series of changes for the good of the future of this department. And Dan will be the person to make sure that we move forward appropriately. He'll be the person overseeing the new work of the permanent chief diversity officer. He'll be the person making sure recruiters get out and bring in people of every background who are ready to serve and have the ability to be great firefighters. We're going to make sure that this department is stronger than ever and is going to exemplify the values of this city. And Dan will be a fantastic champion for the men and women of this department and for its ability to serve everyday New Yorkers. I'm just going to offer a moment in Spanish. Me da un gran placer presentar al próximo comisionado del Departamento de Bomberos, excuse me, Bomberos, de la ciudad Dan Nigro. Él tiene la experiencia, el talento y el carácter para ser un magnífico líder de estos valientes de Nueva York. It is my honor to introduce a man who for decades was a brave and effective firefighter, a natural leader, a natural agent of change and reform, and someone who wins the trust and faith of all around him because he serves in such an exemplary manner. The next commissioner of the FDNY, Dan Nigro. Well, I'm going to lower that for you. I'm your roadie here. Thank you. <laughs> Mayor is very helpful. As I begin, there are a few people, quite a few actually, that I must thank. And first, of course, is the man to my right, Mayor de Blasio. And I thank, I thank you, Mayor, for having faith in me and selecting me to lead the fire department in this exciting time. Thanks also to the folks who encouraged me to seek the position and who continued to encourage me over the course of the process. And I especially thank the people here to my left, my lovely wife Lynn, and my great family for giving me back to the department. They all understand that the commitment of time and energy I will make will change all of our lives. And I will need their support, and I know I can count on it. 
But now is a good time to come clean and confess that for many years I've had two families, the one here with me on my left and a larger one that Chris mentioned, FDNY. When I was born, my father was a young firefighter in Ladder 6 on Canal Street. So the fire department was with us at the dinner table every night. In 1969, as soon as I was old enough to join, I entered the department with a smile that was ear to ear, and I can still remember how happy and proud I was. But before any of the members here think that it's going to be easy with a kindly old uncle at the helm, remember that no one expects more of you than your family. Your friends, your neighbors, strangers, they expect very little of you, but your family expects much. I expect all of you to be the very best, and I will accept nothing less. And let me say, when I say the New York City Fire Department, I'm not forgetting about EMS. I was very proud to be the first FDNY chief of EMS following the merger, and I will work very hard to continue what I started almost 20 years ago. And the rest of the fire department, the non-uniform members also, there's no first class, there's no business class, there's no coach on this flight. I think you're all first class, you're all part of a first class organization, the fire department. I've been enjoying my retirement, I really have. I enjoyed the time with my family, I've enjoyed the travel. So why go back, I've been asked, and there are two reasons there was no hesitation on my part. First, it's the New York City Fire Department. And as Pete Gancy would say, and having uh, Chris speak today and his brother Pete here and his brother-in-law Brian makes Pete a part of this today, Pete would say it doesn't get any better than that. In addition, opportunities to make a difference do not come along often in one's life, if at all. I have been presented with a wonderful opportunity. I listened closely to our mayor's speech back at his inauguration. He spoke of the things we needed to do as a city to improve conditions for everyone. And he said over and over, we won't wait, we'll do it now. And the changes have been coming one after another with the overriding theme, as I see it, of fairness. Being a part of this administration is truly exciting. One of the beautiful things about the fire department is the simplicity of the fire department's mission. Like the toy fire engine my granddaughter over here, Sarah, would ride on, and you wouldn't think I would buy her anything else, maybe an ambulance, but that's, that's as far as I'd go. When you push the button on the fire engine, it would simply say, we're here to help. You call, the fire department comes, there's no preference for social standing, net worth, or anything else. We're here to help. Since I left, the department has made enormous strides in training and operations, and much of that success is due to the leadership of Commissioner Cassano, Chief Kilduff, and the hard work of each and every member, firefighter, paramedic, EMT. We must continue to find ways to operate better and safer. We will not stand still. But we must also take this energy and this ability to be the world leader in operational standards to every other aspect of the department. We must no longer wait for a judge's ruling to tell us what fairness means. We must get out front. We must point the way to change. There is no place in the fire department of our beautiful, diverse city for injustice and inequality. We will do what it takes to make this department a better place for everyone. As we have always said, even in the worst times, it's the greatest job in the world. Let's make sure we enable others to share it with us. Not because we have to, but because it's right. One thing I rarely heard in all my years in the department was, we can't do that. Let's not say it now. I believe there's truth in the saying, with age comes wisdom, because I certainly now have one of those, and I hope I possess the other. I do believe I will be able to lead the department and provide the leadership that enables all of its members to do what they do best. 
help their fellow New Yorkers when they were in need. New York was a great city last year in 2013. I think it's gotten better in 2014. Let's all take this great department into a future that will make all New Yorkers proud. Thank you. We're going to take questions on this topic first, and then we'll be taking some questions on other topics. Let's start with this topic. Question for Commissioner Nigro. Uh, when you were here at the department, this was pre-Twitter, pre-Facebook, pre-iPhone. How have you helped yourself to grasp the technology changes, and with what confidence do you bring your knowledge of technology to uh, your return to the FDM well, my hope is that I will not have to be the uh, head of the IT department of the fire department because we'll soon fail. Uh, I have uh, I have kept up kept up to date with all of those things and have a smartphone and an iPad and a, and a computer and a Twitter account and everything that goes with it. So I do know that uh, communication in today's age is quite different from when I left, and I'm I'm quite sure I'll be capable of uh, of keeping up with the help of the fire department's excellent IT people. Commissioner, can I ask you, uh, you mentioned when you talked of why go back, and you said it's the most incredible job, and um, you wanted to go back, and you didn't hesitate at all, but what went through your mind, everything that you've gone through, and the loss that you endured on 9-11, what went through your mind, did, you, you didn't hesitate at all, you said, but what were you thinking? Certainly. The events of 9-11 and the people of 9-11 never leave me. So when I, when I walk in this building, there's a picture of each and every one of the firefighters we lost, and I think uh, for almost every one of them I can remember a story. But what I was thinking was the fire department was, you know, great before that day. It was exemplary on that day. I've always wanted to be a part of the fire department. Uh, coming back to it is a dream, a dream come true. Commissioner, if I could, it, it, it seems like this is an emotional day for you. If you can just explain what this is like for you and what your feelings are like today. Oh, it's a very, uh, a very emotional day, as uh, as you can see. You probably can you can tell by the tone of my voice. I think. Uh, the fire department holds a very special part in my heart, as Chris described before. You don't. You don't leave it. Once you enter, uh, no matter what happens, you're a part of it. So coming back to it, uh, coming back to the seeing some of the people that are still here that I know um, warms my heart, brings emotions back. Some of them, um, some of them difficult, but all of them, all of them important and strong. And uh, I can't wait to get to the work of the fire department. I have been getting a disability pension, which I will no longer be getting. Uh, after 9-11, I was found to have uh, what hundreds, uh, if not thousands, of firefighters had uh, respiratory problems, and uh, which precluded me from doing what these uniformed people do. But that's not what the mayor hired me to do, so uh, that's it. Uh, you mentioned uh, in your in your speech, uh, Commissioner, that uh, the department must no longer wait for judge a judge to tell you what fairness is. Are you coming in with a set of uh, goals or initial steps to continue expanding diversity within the department? Sure. Well, I think it uh, certainly. I think it's very clear what the goals of this administration are, and I think when that was settled most recently with the Vulcan Society, that case, and the, the mayor spoke out on it, he made it very clear the direction we're going to go. We're not just going to follow that order, but we're going to try to set the tone that this fire department is not here to do something because we're told, but we're going to do something because it's right, because it's the right thing to do. Uh, commissioner, what do you think will be your biggest challenge? Uh, 
<laughs> the first thing a department must do in order to keep us all safe is to continue to operate the way it's the way it's operating to keep our to respond quickly to respond properly and to do those things and that's my grandson um, I didn't even have to look really uh, um, very nice Liam thank you he took me right out of that but uh, of course the diversity issue is a great challenge but it it's a great challenge that I look forward to working together with many people on and to solving and to bringing this department into a very bright future. Uh, yeah. Yeah. For, uh, just for logistic purposes, this was your first day on Monday and did Commission Cassano formally resign? No, we're going to we're going to work out the, the start date. Uh, it'll be sometime in the coming weeks, but we haven't set the uh, date. Uh, I just want to say I have immense respect for Commissioner Cassano. I've worked with him for many, many years. And I said recently, I want to particularly thank him on behalf of the people of the city for how he handled the tragedy in East Harlem, which I thought was exemplary. Uh, and he has served this city very, very well. So we'll come to a decision, you know, quite soon about the exact start date uh, for Commissioner Nigro. Yes. Commissioner, you mentioned earlier, this is for Commissioner mentioned earlier about the family aspect of this and how your father was on East Canal Street. He's here today, so when you found out you were being appointed, what was it like for you, and if you could describe the story as to conveying to him the news that he'd be a new commissioner? Well, uh, conveying to him that I'm now going to be commissioner? Certainly it was a proud moment for me, and I, I know it was a proud moment for him, uh, for our family, for the uh, as you can see over there, every, everyone there uh, in my family, my son-in-laws, my nephews, every one of them has made the fire department their career. So it's, uh, it's, it's somewhat what we do. And to be announced as commissioner, as Pete said, it doesn't get any better than that. My dad came on in uh, 1946 when he returned from a beautiful uh, tour of the islands of the South Pacific, mm. Mm. A, a place I think that the mayor's father also was at that time. And uh, when he came back, he, was, he came onto the fire department at that time, and uh, the rest is history. March. I just wondered, Commissioner, if this is a different fire department for you from the days after you had to take over after 9-11, and what lessons you're bringing to the job today? Well, certainly, as I understand it, uh, most of the firefighters on the department today came on after September 11, 2001. So it's a different department. I look around here at training. It's a different department, technologically more advanced. The training has improved. A lot of lessons from 9-11 uh, were taken here to training, and, uh, and the lessons were learned well, and, and our firefighters come out of school here very well prepared. Uh, I think the... The lessons, a great lesson I learned after 9-11 was organ, organizing something that uh, at first appears to be too large to, to organize and uh, learn that it could be done and, uh, and can be done properly. To have Chris speak here today, what did it mean to you? It, well, besides the fact that I like him personally, it, it made his father a part of today. Uh, and we all know what that means to me. Yeah. Um, for the commissioner, can you give us some specifics on how you plan to diversify the department? And for the mayor, why was Commissioner Cassano not the right person for the job? Because it's no secret he wanted to stay. You know, I, first of all, my broad approach to the appointments process has been to bring in new leaders, very few exceptions. Um, and again, I have worked with Sal Cassano for many years, hold him in very high regard, and have worked very well with him in recent months, too. But, you know, when you're elected to lead, you want to make sure that you have uh, the approach you're looking for exactly as you're trying to achieve it, the philosophy, the experience. Um, it's clear to me, you know, as I, I looked at what Dan Nigro believes in and what he's achieved, that he fit what I need to do and what I believe in and what I'm here to do. 
And uh, I think the um, deep understanding he brings, not only of what is historically extraordinary about this department, but what was made better over the years and what can be made still better, that's really his calling card. If you look at him, he is someone, as you heard, with a, the deepest family tradition in this department and with a keen sense of how to keep making it better, and he's done that already in his career, and that's why he fits my vision for the department. On the question, on the other question, you go ahead. Well, certainly there's already parts of a plan outlined about diversity, and that came, and that's in the agreement. You know, a chief diversity and inclusion officer will be brought on board, someone who we, uh, we trust that can work with a team. Um, we will put together the best team we can and look at things. But the fire department approach to, to things the way I see it is we do things to conclusion. There's been starts and stops, starts and stops. If we, if we come to the scene, we don't leave the scene until we've concluded it operationally. Uh, we came 9-11, we arrived at the World Trade Center. We didn't leave that scene until June when everything was, was down to bedrock. Um, we will work on this and we will finish this when it's done. When this department is the way the mayor and I feel it should be and the people of New York feel it should be. I mean, I think 75 percent of the people saw the mayor's vision and voted in that direction. And I think they continue to see that this is the direction that we want to go. So we will take it to, in fire department manner, we will get into it and we'll be finished when it's done. Last thing, there have been a number of changes to the call-taker system, you know, the 911 uh, call-taker system. I'm wondering if you're satisfied with that. Some of the fire unions are unhappy with changes made under the previous administration. Let me just start and say that this is an area we're going to continue to look at because I think it's one of the most sensitive elements of all that is done by this department and it begins at the point of contact when a citizen calls in. So. I want you to know that we are going to continue to review uh, the plans, the operations, and continue to work on perfecting them, and that's a very important piece of what the Commissioner will be doing. Do you want to add? Okay. Go ahead. Uh, Mr. Mayor, in the wake of the settlement and the Federal Monitor with the, the hiring uh, and the steps that have been taken already, the Department remains almost 90 percent white. Do you have a sense as to what is an appropriate number for diversity in the Department? And as a second part, did you consider, as Commissioner, appointing a person of color or a woman? I uh, considered a wide range of options, as I do with each appointment. But I only uh, interviewed a very few people and very recently, and it was clear to me that Dan Nigro was the person who could achieve the mission in, in every way, all of the things that make up being a successful commissioner. Um, in terms of where we need to go, we have to make steady progress. I don't hinge it on a particular date. I agree with the way Dan characterized it. It is until the job is done. But I think what we have to see is steady progress. And we have to create an atmosphere of inclusion uh, uh, and a recruiting effort that really gives a wide range of New Yorkers an understanding of what an extraordinary career this can be and lets everyone who's a part of the city know that, yes, this is for them. Um, so that's what I'm going to be judging by, what kind of effort we make and what kind of progress we make. Last call on this topic. This topic going once, going twice. Oh, go ahead. Just for Commissioner uh, is there an, an image for a moment from the day you were working on 9-11 that sticks with you the most when you realized the enormity of what was going on? More than one, I bet. <laughs> Yeah, that, w that would be hard to narrow it down, but uh, certainly as Pete and I stood at the base of the North Tower and saw the second plane hit the South Tower, we knew that what had become the worst day of our lives had now doubled and become something neither of us in our wildest dreams could have imagined uh, facing. So at that moment, uh, uh, it was, although Pete remained calm and uh, did what a fire chief does and called, called the right units and did all the right things, even faced with, uh, with the enormity of that, and that sticks in my mind. Okay, off topic. Off topic, yep. 
Uh, this coming week, uh, a little louder. This coming week, there'll be uh, more than 10,000 practitioners of Falun Gong coming uh, to New York City. 10,000 practitioners. It's a, a spiritual practice, uh -huh. um, uh, and uh, there uh, it's for a celebration of World Falun Dafa Day, and also to uh, uh, show that it's being persecuted in China. Uh, this morning they were at uh, City Hall uh, say, uh, saying that they have a trouble obtaining a parade permit and asking for your help. And uh, I'm wondering if, uh, if you're supportive uh, of their demonstration. Of I don't literally know nothing about what their plan is. We'll certainly have people follow up with them. Obviously, we want to give their proposal a fair hearing, uh, and we'll get them an answer. But I, I'm not familiar with it at all. Grace? Um, Ten horses this past year, past racing season, died at Aqueduct Race Track. Um, and I'm curious as to, uh, we haven't heard that much discussion about sort of the condition of race horses in the city. Is this something that you have looked into or, or not looked into? It's, it's just that compared to, I guess, we haven't had any deaths among the horses in Central Park mm -hmm. in recent years, um, but 10 horses that died at Aqueduct have recently. It's, that's a statistic I had not heard before and obviously concerns me, and I need to find out more about it. Yes? Um, Mayor, uh, the UF, uh, UFT chief um, was on the front page of the post today, um, and said that his union is at war with reformers. Um, do you believe that that's an unjustified for a better view uh, for him to carry this? I haven't seen his comments, and I don't know the context. I can say that the contract that we have agreed to pending ratification is absolutely a document filled with reform and improvement for our school system. I think a lot of uh, folks who have looked at it have come to the conclusion, as we have, that this is a, an extraordinary moment of change and improvement for our schools. The fact that we're going to be able to, in up to 200 schools, change work rules and chancellor's uh, recommend, uh, regulations, I should say, the fact that we are going to be able to reward the best teachers, which we've never done before, the fact we're going to be able to uh, additionally incentivize teachers to go to the schools that are having the most trouble and get, getting some of our best teachers to where the need is greatest. These are all foundational changes. Obviously, the greater emphasis on parent engagement and more time for parent-teacher conferences and communication. These are all fundamental reforms. So uh, Mr. Mulgrew was front and center in making those reforms happen with us, and I respect him for it. The uh, House recently voted to open up a select committee into the Benghazi matter. Obviously, you're very close to Hillary Clinton. Do you think House Republicans have been unfair to the sec former Secretary of State in this particular matter? I think it's been politicized, obviously, and I don't think that's appropriate when um, the lives of Americans overseas are the question. So uh, are there legitimate questions that could ever be asked uh, in any situation? Of course. But I think some of what we've seen, including the inclusion of uh, content about Benghazi in fundraising appeals, suggests a politicization that's not appropriate. Um, critics of the, uh, I know in the contract you, you say that the absent teacher reserve pool, um, you know, the teachers would, there would be an expedited process in which teachers, yes. teachers facing, you know, that have improper behavior would leave. Their critics say that um, that could leave some legal wrangling open to as to what constitutes improper behavior. Are you going to, you know, figure out a mechanism with the union? Oh, I think we have it. That's a good question, but I think we have that mechanism right now because there's an arbitrator process. But what's very clear, and this is the nuance I think has been a bit missed, so I'm glad you asked the question. A capable teacher who ended up in the HER pool because the school they worked for closed, for example, is going to have better opportunity to continue teaching effectively under this plan because we're going to give them a chance um, to be able to do the work they know how to do well and continue to improve. Um, but a teacher who's not cut out for this job uh, now faces a process that's much clearer, much faster. They will have an opportunity uh, to prove themselves, and if they can prove themselves, great. But if they can't, it's quite a clear and distinct process, and there's an arbitrator makes the final decision in a clear timeline. So I think it's a great improvement in both instances for the folks who are good and capable teachers and should have a better chance to continue. And for those who need to find a different profession, I think it's going to allow us to get them there much quicker. How, 
confident are you that the moving of unidentified remains to the 9-11 museum site has been handled properly? There have been family members this week who have said they feel that that's not where they belong at the bedrock level. I've talked to incoming Commissioner Nigro about this, and you know I've looked at it carefully myself. Um, a lot of this in the first instance was handled by the Office of the Chief Medical Examiner, which I think has done an absolutely extraordinary job over these years, respectfully and carefully working with the families. Uh, and I've heard a lot of compliments for their work over the years, and this, they really were in the core of this. And the, the basic outline of what we're doing was codified by the previous administration at the end of the previous administration, the basic concept of how this would proceed leading up to the opening of the museum. But. Um, as we've looked at it, we've, we've, there's been a lot of dialogue with family members. A lot of family members have agreed that this is the right approach. It's respectful. It's a very respectful transfer. We thought it was important to be transparent about it. There was some talk in the past about not announcing that it was going to happen. We thought it was appropriate and important to announce it. So I'm confident this is being done respectfully after a lot of consultation with family members and in a way that really uh, dignifies this moment and, and the sacred ground that we're discussing. Thanks, everyone.